All right, so this will be the last reading of the astral world, its scenes, dwellers, and phenomena. Chapter 10, The Astral Light. It must not be supposed for a moment that the astral is simply a plane of nature created for a place of temporary abode and development for souls which have passed out of the physical body, a mere stopping place between reincarnations. Important as are the planes of the astral in the progress of the disembodied souls, they form but one phase of the activities of this great plane of nature. Indeed, even eliminating the disembodied souls from the astral, there would be enough strange and wonderful phenomena on that plane, as well as enough wonderful inhabitants and dwellers on some of its subplanes to still render it the place and region of interest that it always has been to occultists. Before we finish our astral journey and return to earth life, let us make a hasty glance at these wonderful phases of astral phenomena and life. The Astral Light Changing our vibrations, we find ourselves entering a strange region, the nature of which at first you fail to discern pausing a moment until your astral vision becomes attuned to the peculiar vibrations of this region, you find that you are becoming gradually aware of what may be called an immense picture gallery, spreading out in all directions and apparently bearing a direct relation to every point of space on the surface of the earth. At first, you find it difficult to decipher the meaning of this great array of pictures. The trouble arises from the fact that they are arranged not one after the other in sequence on a flat plane, but rather in sequence one after another in a particular order, which may be called the order of Xness in space, because it is neither the dimension of length, breadth, or depth. It is practically the order of the fourth dimension of space, which cannot be described in terms of ordinary spatial dimensions. Again, you find upon closely examining the pictures that they are very minute, practically microscopic in size, and require the use of a peculiar magnifying power of astral vision to bring them up to a size capable of being recognized by your faculty of visual recognition. The astral vision, when developed, is capable of magnifying any object, material, or astral to an enormous degree. For instance, the trained occultist is able to perceive the whirling atoms and corpuscles of matter by means of this peculiarity of astral vision. Likewise, he is able to plainly perceive many fine vibrations of light which are invisible to the ordinary sight. In fact, the peculiar astral light which pervades this region is due to the power of the astral vision to receive and register those fine vib vibrations of light. Bring this power of magnifying into operation, you will see that each of the little points and details of the great world picture so spread before you in the astral light is really a complete scene of a certain place on earth at a certain period in the history of the earth. It resembles one of the small views in a series of moving pictures, a single view on the roll of film. It is fixed and not in motion, and yet we can move forward along the fourth dimension and, this, uh, and thus obtain a moving picture of the history of any point on the surface of the earth, or even combine the various points into a larger moving picture in the same way. Let us prove this by an actual experiment. Close your eyes for a moment while we travel back in time, so to speak, along the series of these astral records. Indeed, they travel back to the beginning in the history of the earth. Now open your eyes. Looking around you, you perceive the pictured representation of strange scenes filled with persons wearing a peculiar garb. But all is still. No life. 
no motion. Now, let us move forward in time at a much higher rate than that in which the astral views were registered. You now see flying before you the great movement of life on a certain point of space, in a far distant age. From birth to death, you see the life of these strange people, all in the space of a few moments. Great battles are fought, and cities rise before your eyes, all in a great moving picture, flying at a tremendous speed. Now stop, and then let us move backward in time. Still gazing at the moving pictures, you see a strange sight, like that of reversing the film in a moving picture. You see everything moving backward, cities crumbling into nothingness, men rising from their graves, and growing younger each second until they are finally born as babes, everything moving backward in time instead of forwards. You can thus witness any great historical event or follow the career of any great personage from birth to death or backwards. You will notice, moreover, that everything is semi-transparent and that accordingly you can see the picture of what is going on inside of buildings as well as outside of them. Nothing escapes the astral light records. Nothing can be concealed from it. You have gazed at the great world picture in the records in the astral light, the great Akashic records, as we Hindus call it. In these records are to be found pictures of every single event, without exception, that has ever happened in the history of the earth, recorded just exactly as it really happened. Moreover, the record being ultra-photographic and including the smallest detail. By traveling to a point in time on the fourth dimension, you may begin at this point and see a moving picture of the history of any part of the earth from that time onto the present. Or you may reverse that sequence by traveling backwards as we have seen. You may also travel in the astral on ordinary space dimensions and thus see what happened simultaneously all over the earth at any special moment of time, if you wish. As a matter of strict truth, however, I must inform you that the real records of the past, the great Akashic records, really exists on a much higher plane than the astral, and that which you have witnessed is but a reflection, practically perfect, however, of the original records. It requires a high degree of occult development in order to perceive even this reflection in the astral light. And unaided by my own power, you could not perceive these sights at this time. An ordinary clairvoyant, however, is often able to catch occasional glimpses of these astral pictures and may thus describe fairly well the happenings of the past. In the same way, the psychometrist, given an object, may be able to give the past history of the object, including a description of the persons associated therewith. That concludes chapter 10. We're going to move on to chapter 11, Astral Entities. Without intending to go deeply into this subject, for the same is reversed for the sole teaching of the advanced pupil. It must not be carelessly spread before others. I think it well to call your attention to the fact that on certain planes of the astral, there exist certain entities or living beings which never were human and never will be, for they belong to an entirely different order of nature. These strange entities are ordinarily invisible to human beings, but under certain conditions they may be sensed by the astral vision. Strictly speaking, these strange beings do not dwell upon the astral at all, that is, not in the sense of the astral as a part of space or a place. We call them astral entities simply because they become visible for the first time to man when he is able to vision on the astral or by means of the astral senses, and for no other reason. So far as place or space is concerned, these entities or beings dwell upon the earth just as do human beings. 
They vibrate differently from us. That is all. They are also usually of but a microscopic size and would be invisible to the human eye if they vibrated on the same plane as do we. The astral vision not only senses their vibrations under certain conditions, but also under certain other conditions, it magnifies their forms into perceptible size. Some of these astral entities are known as nature spirits, the inhabitant, um, inhabit streams, rocks, mountains, forests, etc. Their occasional appearance to persons of psychic temperament or in whom a degree of astral vision has been awakened has given rise to the numerous tales and legends and folklore of all nations regarding a strange order of beings to which various names have been given as for instance, okay, fairies, pixies, elves, brownies, lens, little folk, tiny people, etc., and similar names found in the mythologies and legends of all people. The old occultists called the earth entities of this class by the name of gnomes. Okay, yeah, called the earth entities of this class by the name of gnomes, the air entities as sliffs, the water beings as undines, and the fire as ether beings, as salamanders. This class of astral entity, as a rule, avoid the presence of man and fly from place and fly from places in which he dwells. For instance, they avoid large cities as men avoid a cemetery. They prefer the solitudes of nature and resent the onward march of men which drives them further and further into new regions. They do not object to the physical presence of man so much as they do his mental vibrations which are plainly felt by them and which are very distasteful to them. A certain class of them are what may be called good fellows, and these, once in a while, seem to find pleasure in helping and aiding human beings to whom they have formed an attachment. Many such cases are related in the folklore of the old countries, but modern life has driven these friendly helpers from the scene in most places. Another class, now also very uncommon, seems to find delight in playing elfish, childish pranks, particularly in the nature of practical jokes upon peasants, etc. At spiritualistic seances and similar places, these elfish pranks are sometimes in evidence. The ancient magicians and wonder workers were often assisted by creatures of this class, and even in India, Persia, China, and other oriental lands, such assistance is not unknown, and many of the wonderful feats of these magicians are attributable only to such aid. As a rule, as I have said, these creatures are not unfriendly to man, though they may play a prank with him occasionally. Under some circumstances, they seem particularly apt to play tricks upon neophytes in psychic research who seek to penetrate the astral without proper instruction and without taking the proper precautions. To such a one, they may appear as hideous forms, monsters, etc., and thus drive him away from the plane in which their presence may become apparent to him. However, they usually pay no attention to the advanced cultists and either severely let him alone or else flee his presence. Though cares are not unknown, in the experience of the majority of advanced occultists, when some of these little folks seem anxious and willing to be of aid to the earnest, conscientious inquirer who recognizes them as a part of nature's great manifestation and not as an unnatural creature or vile monstrosity. Okay, astral entities. In addition to the non-human entities which are perceived by astral vision, or on the astral plane, including a number of varieties and classes other than the, those mentioned by me, and to which I purposely have omitted reference for reasons which will be recognized as valid by all true occultists. There are to be found on the astral or on the earth plane by means of astral vision 
a great class of entities or semi-entities, which occultists know as artificial entities. These artificial entities were not born in the natural manner, nor created by the ordinary creative forces of nature. They are the creations of the minds of men, and are really a highly concentrated class of thought forms. They are not entities in the strict sense of the term, having no life or vitality except that which they borrow from, or have been given by their creators. The student of occultism who has grasped the principle of the creation of thought forms will readily grasp the nature power and limitations of this class of dwellers in the astral. The majority of these artificial entities or thought forms are created unconsciously by persons who manifest strong desire force, accompanied by definite mental pictures of, what, of that which they desire. But many have learned the art of creating them consciously, in an elementary form of magic, white or black. Much of the effect of thought force or mind power is due to the creation of these thought forms. Strong wishes for good, as well as strong causes for evil, tend to manifest form and a semblance of vitality in the shape of these artificial entities. These entities, however, are under the law of thought attraction and go only where they are attracted. Moreover, they may be neutralized and even destroyed by positive thought properly directed in the way known to all advanced students along these lines. Another, and quite a large class of these artificial entities, consist of thought forms of supernatural beings sent out by the strong mental pictures oft repeated of the persons creating them, the creator usually being unconscious of the result. For instance, a strongly religious mother who prays for the protective influence of the angels around and about her children and whose strong religious imagination pictures these heavenly visitors are present by the side of the children, frequently actually creates thought forms of such angel guardians around her children who are given a degree of life and mind vibrations from the soul of the mother. In this way, such guardian angels so created serve to protect the children and warn them from evil and against temptation. Many a pious mother has accomplished more than she realized by her prayers and earnest desires. The early fathers of the church Occidental and Oriental, were aware of this fact, and consequently bade their followers to use this form of prayer and thought, though they did not explain the true underlying reason. Even after the mother has passed on to the higher planes, her loving memory may serve to keep alive these thought form entities, and thus serve to guard her loved ones. In a similar way, many ghost in a similar way, many family ghosts have been created and kept in being in the same way by the constantly repeated tale and belief in their reality on the part of generation after generation. In this class belong the celebrated historic ghosts who warn royal and noble families of approaching death and sorrow. The familiar family ghosts walking the walls of old castles on certain anniversaries are usually found to belong to this class, though not always so. Many haunted houses are explained in this way also. The ghost may be laid by anyone familiar with the laws of thought forms. It must be remembered that these artificial entities are of pure human creation and obtain all their apparent and mind from the action of the thought force of their creators. Repeated thought and repeated belief will serve to keep alive and to strengthen these entities, otherwise they will disappear in time. Many supernatural visitors, saints, semi-divine beings, etc., of all religions, 
have been formed in this way and, in many cases, are kept in being by the faith of the devotees of the church, the chapel, or the shrine. In many temples in Oriental countries, there have been created and kept alive for many centuries the thought form entities of the minor gods and saints, endowed in thought with great power to of response to prayer, offering, and ceremonies. These accepting the belief in these powers are brought into harmony with its vibrations and are affected thereby, for good or evil. The power of the devils of savage races, some of whom practically are devil worshippers, arise in the same way. Even in the early history of the Western religions, we find many references to the appearance, appearance of the devil and of his evil work witchcraft, diabolical presences, etc., all of which were created thought-form entities of this kind. Many of the effects of sorcery, black magic, etc., were produced in this way, the element of belief, of course, adding greatly to the effect. The voodoo practices in Africa, and later, of Martinique, and the kahuna practices of Hawaii, are based on these same principles. The effect of charms, etc., depends on, depend on the same laws, including the effect of faith. Even certain forms of spirits, so-called, of certain forms of spiritualistic seances arise from this principle and have never been human beings at all. An understanding of this principle will aid in the interpretation of many puzzling phases of psychic phenomena. Okay, spirit return. Nothing that I have said must be taken as denying the reality and validity of what the Western world knows as spirit return. On the other hand, I am fully familiar with very many instances of the real return to earth life of disembodied souls. But at the same time, I, as well as all other advanced occultists, are equally aware of the many chances of mistake in this class of psychic phenomena, shades, and even astral shells, too often are mistaken for departed loved ones. Again, many apparently real spirit forms are nothing more or less than semi-vitalized thought forms, artificial entities, such as I have just described. Again, many mediums really are clairvoyant and are able to unconsciously draw to some extent upon the astral records for their information regarding the past instead of receiving the communication from a disembodied soul in all honesty and in good faith in many cases. Occultism does not deny the phenomena of modern Western spiritualism. It merely seeks to explain its true nature and to verify it with some and to verify some of it while pointing out the real nature of others. It should be welcomed as an ally by all true spiritualists. Astral Vision It must not be supposed that the astral vision dawns suddenly upon anyone in full force. Rather, it is a matter of slow, gradual development in the majority of cases. Many persons possess it to a faint degree and fail to develop it further for want of proper instruction. Many persons have occasional flashes of it and are entirely without it at other times. Many feel the astral vibrations rather than seeing with the astral vision. Others gain a degree of astral vision by means of crystal gazing, etc., that which is frequently referred to as psychic sight or psychic sensing is a form of astral vision or sensing. Psychism is bound up with astral phenomena in all cases. In this little manual, I have sought to give you, in a few lines, the great underlying facts of the astral plane. I have crowded very much into a very small space, so you will have to read and study my words more carefully in order for you to get the full meaning. In fact, this is not a book to be read on and then laid aside, rather. 
it should be reread and restudied until all of the essence is extracted. The glimpses of a number of the subplanes of the astral should give you a general, clear idea of many other scenes on that great plane. Remember, these scenes are typical of those witnessed by any advanced occultist who is able to travel on those planes, as you, yourself, may verify when you are able to vision on these planes. They are underdrawn rather than overdrawn. Some of the more startling and sensational scenes have been omitted altogether, as I have no desire to attract or cater to those seeking sensation. My work is for the earnest student alone. Use this manual as a key to unlock many mysteries, not as a book to while away an idle hour. Do not have any idle hours. Do not try to kill time. Be an earnest, thoughtful occultist, ever unfolding and evolving as you progress along the path. Look forward, not backward. Look upward, not downward. Have faith, not fear. For within your soul is a spark of the divine flame which cannot be extinguished. Okay, well that wraps it up. First reading of the astral world, its scenes, dwellers, and phenomena. I thank each and every one of you for participating um, in this listening session. This is my first audiobook from start to finish. A book published somewhere in the early 1900s. I always forget. I have to look it up on another file to get the actual publishing date here. But it was around 100 years old. We'll get that in the descriptions. But again, we do thank you for listening to this series. I've got um, some good books here for the next time. It's basically going to be a coin flip. I'm not ready to announce it yet. But I have two books in my hands right now. We're going to flip a coin and we're going to start reading. So after this Sunday, we're going to basically have a new chapter and a new book. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I really do uh, want to encourage each and every one of you to just sense into these subtle areas, subtle layers, subtle planes, and share your experiences because I've had a lot of my own that I'm going to be sharing with you here after a little while. So again, thank you so much and... We will leave you with one thought and one thought alone. Deep peace in the pneuma of now.